I am preaching through uh, 2 Timothy right now. So if you have a Bible and you want to know where we will be, just open it up, find your place in 2 Timothy, and uh, you, will, you will find your ability to read right along with me very quickly. Well, I introduced a little bit about 2 Timothy last week, and we worked our way through most of the first chapter, and I would just like to remind as we open up this morning that 2 Timothy is a very personal letter. It feels even more personal than 1 Timothy. Most of the books of the Bible that we call epistles are written to the church uh, in a certain place, uh, or they're written, they're named after the author, like we have 1 Peter, 2 Peter, um, or you know, the book of Romans, the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Thessalonians have places, but uh, Timothy, Timothy and Titus are named after the recipients, and of all of the New Testament letters, this is the most personal. It just feels that way, and it turns out that it's the very last letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. It's the last portion of Scripture that he wrote. Uh, we have them in a certain order for a certain reason, but if you wanted them chronologically, you would say this is the last the last letter of Paul. And Paul is in prison. Uh, when he wrote this letter, he was in prison, and a little different than the situation at the end of the book of Acts. If you remember in the end of the book of Acts, Paul had been in prison for quite a while, but his treatment was relatively good. In fact, he was under house arrest for most of the time. But now he says something different. He says, I'm in prison like a criminal. A different kind of imprisonment and this is the one that we don't think he ever got out of this was the last letter he wrote and so it's written with a different heart it's very reflective in places Paul makes some uh, observations and judgments and he gives some very important instruction to Timothy and to those who would receive uh, this message God wanted us to have this as part of his holy word to us as scripture. And the way we can interpret it and, and find the right meaning is to say what was the original intent of the author, Paul? What did he intend for Timothy to understand? How did Timothy receive it? And when we see all of that, we say, now, what application for us can we draw? And we're going to do that this morning. But let's just remember, um, it is a blessed thing to have such a personal letter in God's word not just plastic or, or, or rigid uh, is a better word for it, not just synthetic, uh, these are the kinds of things you should do if you're a Christian, but real people, real places, real instructions, and we can see examples to follow. Now, we didn't quite finish chapter 1 last week, so we're going to pick up our reading today in Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. And we will read through verse 13 of chapter 2. That will be our text for this morning. So let's look at God's word together. 2 Timothy chapter 1 starting in verse 15. You know that all those in the province of Asia have deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesephorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he diligently searched for me and found me. May the Lord grant that he obtained mercy from him on that day. You know very well how much he ministered at Ephesus. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the commanding officer. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless... He competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer ought to be the first to get a share of the crops. Consider what I say. 
for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead and descended from David according to my gospel, for which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. This is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This saying is trustworthy, for if we died with him, <coughs> we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. We'll stop our reading of God's word there. Let's commit this to prayer. Heavenly Father, as we study your word this morning, we pray that you would do for us as you did for the disciples when Jesus taught them. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. We pray that you would do that for us today. We pray that you would do for us what you did for Lydia when Paul brought the good news to her. Her heart was opened to the message. Would you help us, O oh Father, not only be able to intellectually understand what the Bible says today, but that you would open our hearts to the message that we might be driven with joy to obedience. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Paul began uh, this section of the letter uh, I, we begin with the section of the letter where Paul began to talk about people. And he names off people you see nowhere else in the Bible. We don't know anything about them except this little bit that Paul wrote here. And I'm thankful that Paul included their names. He said, you know, all, you know that all those in the province of Asia have deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. Well, we don't know anything else about those two. There's nothing else in the Bible about them. And everything written about them later on is pure speculation. All we know is that there are two men who must have been known by Paul to the point of friendship. Uh, he said they abandoned him. Maybe they had abandoned the gospel message in the church as well. We don't know. But whatever happened... Paul was suffering for the gospel. He had been arrested again for his proclamation of the gospel and they were not there for him. They had abandoned him and he named them. However, as a counterpoint to that, he said, May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he diligently searched for me and found me. May the Lord grant that he obtained mercy from him on that day. You know how very well, very well how much he ministered in Ephesus. Now here we have a man named Onesephorus. We don't know much about him either. Let me open up my notes here. But well, we do know a few things. One, that Onesiphorus uh, made it a point to go out and encourage Paul to meet some of the needs he had. Maybe it was physical or financial. And that he also blessed the church greatly in Ephesus. What we have here is not a preacher of the gospel. Uh, it doesn't seem that. He doesn't talk about his message and his preaching. It talks about his ministry, which is the word service, and his help, his encouragement, and what he did. And his name is here. And it made a big difference in Paul's level of encouragement and his ability to sustain in ministry, even under harsh circumstances. And I find it interesting that we have here two or three verses of the Bible where we're named 
people were given names um, and yet we don't know much more about them and yet the Lord decided that he would both honor and dishonor these people for all all of future Christian history, when we read these passages, we would know that these men were not helpful to Paul. They had abandoned him in a time of need, and Onesephorus ministered. You know, sometimes we think about Christianity and the great men of God being the ones that are the preachers and proclaimers. And so we may point to uh, Billy Graham and to the vast ministry that he had during his lifetime and the great crowds and the numbers of peoples that came forward during his messages and appeals to repentance and faith in Christ. And we can talk about the big impact that this man of God had. And sometimes we begin to think that it's the preachers and proclaimers that are the great men of God and everybody else um, has maybe a different role. And yet God wanted these uh, people that we would overlook to be noticed in Scripture. Onesephorus did a great job of ministry. He, it says here, often refreshed me. That means there was a lot of either physical ministry or encouragement. He brought things to help Paul. He spoke to Paul. He encouraged Paul. It says also, he was not ashamed of my chains. You know, that's very important, that somebody would know that you're there with them through thick and thin. Uh, and, and then when that person is in a political place of embarrassment, oh, this person's in jail. Yet Onesimus stood firm and said, that's my Paul. And also it says, when he was in Rome, he diligently searched for me and found me. You know, nowadays we can search for things on the Internet. We had a phone book uh, before that. We had telephone and we had just different ways of tracking people down rather quickly if we needed to. But can you imagine um, with not the kind of transportation we have now and not the kind of communication we have now, how much work it must have taken on a Sephiroth to go through Rome looking for Paul so that he could encourage him when he needed it. He put forth a sacrificial effort, and evidently his family uh, encouraged him in that and helped him in that and uh, bore some of the burden of him being gone to search for Paul because he also praised that God would have mercy on the whole household. Onesephorus worked really hard to try to help Paul, and his name is recorded in the Bible. God sees your ministry. You may say, well, I'm not the kind of person to get up and talk. Well, that's fine. But are you a faithful person that serves and sees opportunities and sacrifices in order to bless another believer, in order to further the ministry of the gospel? God sees and he honors. You know, uh, if you go back to... Uh, the Gospels and look through the stories of what was happening. You even see things like uh, when Jesus was anointed in Bethany with that expensive perfume and Judas uh, said, you know, that was a waste of money and, and Jesus said, no, you don't understand what she's doing. She's preparing me for my burial and everywhere the Gospel is proclaimed, the story is going to be told. And God would see something like that, that everybody else would sort of overlook and give it a prime piece of scriptural real estate so that we'll all see it. I want you to know that God looks at you and your life. He watches what you're doing, and he knows what's going on. He knows the opportunities you have, and the Lord, our Father, knows if you're a Phygelus and Hermogenes, or if you're an Onesephorus. And uh, whether or not I'm preaching and proclaiming God's word, I pray that my lifestyle might be the lifestyle of an Onesephorus, the one who would seek high and low, far and wide for an opportunity to bless someone else. 
And so that's an important thing, and I'm so glad that in this personal letter that Paul included that, that we might have this kind of an example. And then, having set the stage with both a bad example and a good example, Paul gave some encouragement to Timothy as we begin in chapter 2. You, therefore, my son, he said to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Our strength comes from Christ Jesus. Our strength comes from the grace of God. We have no strength of our own, and yet he says to be strong in the grace that comes from Christ Jesus. God has provided for you as a believer the same spirit and the same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead. The same power that was at work in Christ Jesus, raising him from the dead, is at work in you, the scripture says. And yet we are also told to be strong in that grace. Do you know that there is God's power from on high coming down on us, but there is, a, there is an aspect by which we grab hold of it. There is the, the, the way that we participate in it. And our faith and our faithfulness makes a difference in the kind of thing we see going on in our lives. This is a theme through Scripture. We see in the teachings of God about providence in the Old Testament, especially, for example, when God gave these Israelites leaving Egypt and heading towards the Promised Land instructions, He said for them many times, if you will seek after me, if you will have no other gods before me, if you will obey my commands, it will go well for you. I will drive out the enemies in front of you. I will provide for you a, an abundant harvest. Uh, you will be blessed and you will have healthy children and many of them. He the, the Lord in the books of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy gave all kinds of promises about his providence. That is God's working in the world around us so that he can make the path straight for those who trust in him. And this is what Paul said to Timothy. Be strong in the grace of Jesus Christ. We need to take hold of that power that God has promised to all believers. And the way we do that is by trusting and obeying and being faithful in even the little areas of obedience. When we say it is Jesus Christ who is on the throne, we obey his commands and we pray to the Lord. Help. And so Paul said to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus in verse 2, he said, and here Paul is thinking about the continuation of the church before he passes, before he's gone, before he's not here to minister anymore. Paul wants to make sure that the church is faithful and will continue, and so he gives this instruction to Timothy. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 is a verse that's worth highlighting in your Bibles. It is what I call the discipleship chain. It is one that goes all the way back to Jesus. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. When we talk about the teachers and leaders of the church, what we want from them and what we want to pass along to the future teachers and leaders of the church is a faithfulness to God's word and a process by which that will continue to be faithful. What you've heard from me in the presence of many, Paul didn't secretly teach Timothy some things and then say, go and pass these along. He proclaimed publicly among many who believed with Timothy, these are the truths about Jesus Christ our Lord. These are the truths about God. This is what is trustworthy. This is what we ought to know and believe and do. And now take this and entrust it with other faithful men. That's a plural. Go ahead and pass it on to others who are faithful. 
that they can continue to pass it on to others who are faithful. In the Catholic Church, uh, they have this idea of the Pope, who is uh, the, the one whom the primary authority in the church is passed down, apostolic secession, they call it, so that in their theory, Jesus gave Peter a very special place, and then when Peter passed it along to somebody else and passed it along to somebody else, and that there is supposedly an unbroken chain um, from, from today's Pope all the way back to when Jesus had uh, blessed Paul. And obviously, uh, if you study church history, you'll know that this unbroken chain is, is a bunch of hogwash. But, but also, you will know that, um, you will know that th these men have not proven themselves to be uh, men of God. In fact, one wasn't even a man. Uh, there, there was one uh, female pope back in history who, that's an interesting story too. But uh, the, the point is that they, the idea was that there needed to be some sort of connection that we could count on that brings people all the way back to Jesus. And what Paul gave us here in 2 Timothy 2.2 2 is that connection. We have a faithful message that's faithfully passed on from faithful men to faithful men, faithful people to faithful people, in the presence of many, so not private, keeping the, the message true from generation to generation to generation. And if you look around and see which churches have gone astray, they went astray because at some point they broke down in the passing of the faithful message to the next generation or to the next leader. And they picked someone as a leader who had influence or who had charisma, or who had standing or who was handsome or who was good looking or whatever else. And, and they said, this person, they, you know, I, I, this person is a leader, let's follow him. And they didn't put the primary emphasis on the faithful message and the faithful man. You know, your preacher doesn't have to be an, a, a super eloquent person to be faithful with the Word of God. He needs to be faithful to the Word of God. And yes, there are some people that are easier to listen to than others, but I would much rather uh, hear somebody who stutters and stumbles and struggles in their communication if I know that everything that they're sharing is trustworthy and true. Boy, I will sit there and I will listen and I will think and I will try and I will do my best to glean from that person, whether it's a Sunday school teacher or a pastor or whoever else. If I know by their lifestyle, if I know by, their, uh, by comparing what they teach to the Word of God, if I know by their heart that they are a faithful person and they are desiring to pass along the faithful message, boy, I have somebody I trust and somebody I'll go with and somebody I'll listen to and somebody I'll work with. In fact, I'm just going to give a quick testimony. Uh, I grew up going to Parkview Baptist Church, and um, mostly in the 1980s was my formative uh, years, my early Christian years, in the 90s as well, but in the 80s. Um, and there was uh, a man who was on staff at Parkview as uh, the Minister of Education for some period of time, and he always had some sort of secondary role his name was Brother Ron Tyndall. And now we had a big staff at Parkview, and Brother Bob Anderson was our pastor, and man, he could preach. He, he, he preached 10 <clears throat> sermons in one, long outlines, and he knew what he was doing. He stood up tall and was very eloquent. We had an associate pastor who could preach with thunder. Uh, we had, uh, at later a point, a youth minister who could preach as well as anybody. But Brother Ron, who was on staff, I tell you what, it was hard to listen to him. He, he really stopped and stumbled on his Sunday school lessons and his, his sermons. And yet, because he was a faithful man, we knew everything he shared was true and we listened. And it was hard to hear sometimes, hard to listen, because it, was, it just didn't come out as smoothly as it could. But it was always faithful and true. And one of the things that I, I love about Brother Ron is that 
he had a one-on-one -on -one counseling ministry where people who needed some encouragement or help or advice, marriages struggling, needed to know more about how to get close to God, whatever else, he had a counseling ministry in his office. And he would sit and just open up the Word of God and pray with people. And that man led more people to Jesus during his time as pastor there, associate pastor during those two or three decades of service there than I think any other pastor. Even the ones with the big crowds that would come forward in the service, he was leading them to the Lord across the table with the Bible open and talking to them one-on-one, -on -one, a faithful man. And everybody knew, everybody in the church respected him for his faithfulness and his, his, his trustworthiness with the scripture. So even on the Sundays when it was his turn to preach, we were ready because we knew who he was. And that's what uh, I think we really want to make sure that we don't prejudge people on their speaking ability. We want to look at how well they know the Word of God and uh, how much they will remain faithful to it. Let's look at verse 3. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the commanding officer. Well, that one's a pretty easy analogy for us. Uh, a soldier has one purpose. He, he doesn't go along doing whatever and living the lifestyle of a civilian. He has a discipline. He has a purpose. He has one authority, and he does that one thing. That's pretty easy for us to get, but I, I, I'm always amazed at this one modern-day example. There is out at Long Beach, California, um, there is a, a ship out there, a museum. It's called the Queen Mary. And the Queen Mary was a luxury cruise liner, and it could hold about 3,000 people. And it was this just super upper-class, beautiful uh, thing. The, the, you would go out to the dining room and there would be 15 dishes uh, for your meal, just knives and forks laid out. I don't even know how all of that works, you know. If, if it goes beyond a, uh, a couple of forks and spoons, I'm lost, you know. But they had this whole elaborate set, fine china, beautiful bedrooms, well decorated. And this was the luxury cruise liner, but in the Second World War, things got pretty serious and we needed to increase our ability to move troops and so the Queen Mary was retrofitted from a peacetime vessel to a wartime vessel and they cleared out those luxury bedrooms and stacked bunk beds eight tiers high and they traded in those expensive uh, fine china dishes for a metal tray with the indents in it like they have in the prisons and, and school cafeterias, which makes me wonder why they do the same thing in both places. But anyway, it was completely transformed. And instead of a luxury cruise for 3,000 people, it was essential troop transport. They could put 15,000 soldiers on that thing and get them where they needed to go. Same ship different purpose. And the truth is, we, we need to be ever aware that we are, as soldiers of the cross, called to live a wartime lifestyle, not a peacetime lifestyle. We don't store up for ourselves treasures on earth no, we do what Jesus said. We store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. We don't do like the foolish one who tore down his barns and built bigger ones to keep uh, all the things that he amassed. We think of what Jesus said. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? And what can a man give for his soul? We are called to be soldiers of the cross. We are called to a wartime 
lifestyle. And why? Because what is at stake are the souls of people. What is at stake is the difference between people hearing clearly the gospel of Christ and people uh, not hearing clearly the gospel of Christ. So the Queen Mary is, I think, a wonderful museum that shows the difference in wartime, peacetime, and is a good example for us. How many luxury cruise liner things in our lives could we change out for the practical effort of winning the lost? When I first began to think about my call to ministry, I remember one day uh, I was already going to East Texas Baptist University. I was already considering pastoring as my vocational call to ministry. And yet uh, we had this missions emphasis chapel service. And all the lights were turned off and everybody had a candle. And um, Alan Thompson, I think, was the leader of that particular chapel service. He said, just look, you know, with the candlelit service, he said, just look at all the light in the room and, and, and think about what it is that you bear the light of Christ so that others can see. And he, he said, I want everybody to blow out their candles. And we did, and it was completely dark, except for the exit signs that the law requires you to have. But it was completely dark. And then he lit one candle. And he said, you know, this one candle is all by itself in the dark. And yet by itself, this one candle is enough to give an orientation to everybody in the room. And he said, if, if everybody has a light to shine, we can shine it all together in one place where it's well lit. Or we can bring our light somewhere where it's totally dark and it makes the biggest difference. And it was an appeal to missions, an appeal to go off to where the lost are and bring the good news to them. The point I'm making here is there are places in the world and places even locally, to be honest with you, where there are peoples who are far from the good news of Jesus. There is no one nearby that shines the light and our job, if we are to be a good soldier, is to look around and find where is the darkness and bring our light there. But cruise liners don't do that. Warships do. Civilians don't do that. Soldiers do. And Paul said to Timothy, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the commanding officer. And I want to just encourage you to think about your life. Have I, have I taken the blessings of God as a personal luxury? Or have I fixed my life in such a way that I'm pouring those blessings out as a good soldier of the cross? Let's continue. Verse 5. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Uh, again, in those ancient games, they gave a crown for the winner. We give gold medals, but they gave crowns to the winner. The point is, uh, there is a certain right way to go about things and a certain discipline that it takes to compete and to win. And Paul just used that example to Timothy saying, look, you be faithful even in the little things, doing things the right way. And the person who does those things the right way is eligible to be the victor. Verse 6, beautiful passage. The hard-working farmer ought to be the first to get a share of the crops. If we are uh, using the farming analogy now, Paul's given 
This is the fourth teacher, uh, soldier, athlete, and now farmer. You know, you can be a knowledgeable farmer and know about the seasons and know about fertilizers and know about uh, the right time to plant and, and harvest. That's nice, but if you're not out there doing these things, doing the hard work of farming every day, you're not going to see a good return. A good farmer is always busy about the work of the farm. A good farmer gets up in the morning and goes no matter what. The Bible tells us the one that keeps looking at the sky for the right season never gets around to planting his seed. But the good faithful farmer goes out every day and works knowing that he can't control what the weather's gonna do he can't control what the ground is going to produce. That's up to God, but he can do his part. And if he will do his part, he gives that crop an opportunity to come. And then he gets to share in the wonderful harvest. Jesus talked about that in John chapter 4, uh, how we all share in the blessing of the harvest. Verse 7, consider what I say. For the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Can I just take a moment to share with you too that that's a good way to approach reading the Bible? So many times we, we read it and then immediately we want somebody to explain it to us. Well, what does that mean? And Paul said to Timothy, Consider what I say and the Lord will give you understanding. Would you take the time when you read the Bible, especially when you read those hard parts, and say, I don't know what this means. Read it. Think about it. Read it again. Think about it. And if you still don't know what it means, read it again and think about it. And you may have to put it on the back burner for a while and just let your brain process it and ask the Lord. And then at some point, that understanding is going to come. Do you know the Lord will help you understand what his word means. The Lord will help you understand from his word what he wants you to do. And so we don't need to be so quick to just ask somebody to explain it to us. We want God's word to come to us and we want to engage it and we want the Lord to bring understanding to us. Now, yes, we're going to need to do that together. We're going to need to help each other understand but our first instinct ought not be to look at it once and say, I don't get it, and get somebody else to explain it, because then that other person becomes our authority and not God's Word. So let's, let's look and hope that God's Word would make sense to us as we pray for God to open up our minds. Let's look at this last portion here. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead and descended from David, according to my gospel for which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal. Jesus Christ risen from the dead is not just an historical appeal to his historic resurrection that Christ rose from the dead, that's how we know that we can be saved, but also to speak of his position. When Jesus rose from the dead, he was made victorious and shown to be Lord that God gave him the name that is above every name, that is the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When we say, remember the risen Lord, we're saying, remember the risen Christ, we're saying that he is the king of our lives. Descended of David, that he is human like us, uh, that, that there's fully God and fully man, but also, once again, the one who brings forth all the promises of God and the one who is Lord. He said, For which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. That is my favorite verse in this chapter, that we can be bound up, that the world can try to silence us, that the world can take a believer and do whatever it takes to shame or silence that person, and yet the Word of God continues to pour forth. There is no way that any power of this world can chain the Word of God. Do you realize how powerful the Word of God is? 
If it happened today that in the providence of God we were at war and our church disappeared like those churches in the Ukraine that just were gone in an instant, the word of God continues. And we have a message that we know is faithful that Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or tittle, not one dot from God's word will pass away. Not one word. Let's conclude with this final bit of encouragement. This is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul said to Timothy, I went through all of this stuff because I want people to be saved. I'm willing to be a prisoner. I'm willing to lose my wealth. I'm willing to lose my, my standing if it makes it easier for someone else to come to know Jesus. Think about the four people that carried the paralytic to the rooftop of a house where Jesus was preaching and lowered him down. They made it easier for him to come to Jesus. And it came at a cost. It came at some work. But they blessed that man. And Paul said, this is why I do it all. I know that my hard work makes a difference. Here's the trustworthy saying. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Well, if we died with him, we will also live with him. Is the picture of believer's baptism. If, if, if I am crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so when we take someone who proclaims that they have trusted in Jesus and, and turned from their sin, we say things like, upon, uh, in obedience to the command of, of, of the Lord, uh, upon your public profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And we say, buried with Christ in baptism, and risen to walk in newness of life. Uh, Christ died for our sins, and so we are dead to sin. That's another scripture, Romans 6, I believe. And so we, uh, we die with him, we live with him. Because Christ died and rose again, we have an eternal hope, and we know that we will live forever because we have died and risen with Christ. If we endure we will also reign with him. Now this is uh, the endurance of being faithful through difficulty. Uh, if we endure with him, we will reign with him. When Jesus returns, uh, he sets up his glorious throne. He separates the people like the sheep from the goats, um, separating sheep from goats. And there is the eternal kingdom of God. And I don't know what it's all going to be like, but Jesus did seem to teach that there were going to be certain places of service and honor and leadership even in eternity. And so we told parables like the parable of the talents that those who were faithful with few things would be entrusted with many things. If we endure, there is a crown, there is a reward, there is a promise that we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Is that not one of the scariest things that God's word says? You know, Jesus said it that way in Matthew 10. He said, Everyone who will acknowledge me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. That's Matthew 10, 23. It's, uh, it's a scary thing to think about what it is that somebody would deny Jesus. And this is not, by the way, the occasional... This, let, me, let me say that this is not the same thing as the faithlessness of the next verse. Because you have a story uh, in your head already. You have a, a, a memory of Peter. 
You have a memory of Peter when Christ was led away to be crucified. And you know how Peter followed at a distance over to the uh, high priest's house where Jesus was being put in an unjust trial. And you remember the narrative where Jesus said to Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Jesus, uh, he told Peter that very plainly. And, and Peter said, no, nah, even if they have to kill me, I'm not going to deny you. And yet, when we get to that passage of Scripture, it says, Matthew 26, 69, if you want to remember the reference, the servant girl approached Peter and said to him, you were with Jesus the Galilean too. But Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about. When he had gone out to the gateway, another woman saw him and told those who were there, this man was with Jesus the Nazarene, and again he denied it with an oath, I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there approached and said to Peter, you really are one of them, since even your accent gives you away. And then he started to curse and swear with an oath, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the words of Jesus. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Now, that is as good a story of somebody denying Jesus as you will ever find. And yet we know that a couple of pages later, Jesus went to Peter and said, do you love me? And he said, you know I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. So there is this kind of what we would call unfaithfulness. Peter's denial of Jesus was not the kind of denial that we're talking about here. Lord, help us that this doesn't happen to us. But the encouragement we have from Paul to Timothy is, if we are faithless, if we stumble, Jesus is faithful. He doesn't stumble he cannot deny himself even if we stumble but Jesus did talk about the need to confess him before the father Romans 10 9 says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved. The good confession of trusting in Jesus, if we will call Jesus Lord and proclaim him publicly, that's, that's to just tell everyone, I'm a believer. Even if we stumble, if our faith is in Jesus, he is faithful. And he will see us through. He will be our Savior. But if we reject Jesus and we stand before others saying, I do not accept him as Lord. I do not believe in him. If we deny him before me and he is not the Messiah, then Jesus said, I will deny him before my Father in heaven. So Paul gave Timothy that encouragement. If we die with Christ, we will live with him, the promise. And if we endure the hardships and suffering, we will reign with him. If we don't belong to him, if we deny him, he will deny us. But if we are faithless, if in our faith we stumble in our walk, if in our Christianity we act unchristian sometimes, he's still faithful. And he still loves you. And he's still your Lord because he can't deny himself. I hope that's an encouragement to you this morning. So we have a lot of different sets of instructions there from Paul to Timothy. And I'm certain that some of that we can feel how it applies to us. My encouragement to you today is be sure of your trust in Jesus. Be encouraged to endure whatever the cost of being a Christian is. Pay the price, whatever it takes that others can know the good gospel of Jesus and take heart even if we stumble he's still there for us would you stand with me as we close in prayer and perhaps God is speaking to your heart from this message today if so you come forward during our song of invitation Heavenly Father
We praise your name today. And I ask, Lord, that your scripture would be clear to our minds and our hearts would be open to its message and that you will help us to walk in your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Luke leads in song.